from a UX background initially. I have uh, been doing startups since 2008. So my first startup was we were adding a layer on top of the web to do QA, so uh, to be able to test different websites like this. Uh, so we did that for a year. I put a lot of money, my own money in it, and we ran out of money just a couple months before being able to launch the full product. So we had customers lined up. We had everything we needed to keep going. But we ran out of money a couple of months before having all the features that they, were, they required. <laughs> Since it was, it was not a good time to raise money, uh, it was 2008, actually. It was not the best year. Uh, we ended up uh, closing the business, which um, amounted to a lot of uh, regrets, which is something you do want to avoid when you're starting up. Uh, so from there, I decided I was going to go and learn Agile initially, because nobody was talking about Lean at that point. So I did the uh, normal thing to do. I moved to Hong Kong, uh, found myself a job in Beijing, and went to work for a company called Thought ThoughtWorks. After a while, I started having the, the entrepreneurial bug coming back, and I decided to go start a new business. Did that a little bit in Singapore. I uh, realized that $6,000 a month uh, was a bit too expensive when you're starting up. So I decided to go back to Montreal and give it a try another time. I don't know what's happening with this. OK. Yeah, so I started a business in B2B specifically, another business in B2B, uh, which initially was supposed to be a fasting. We're doing a perception of companies for people uh, looking for jobs. So the employer brand, it was super hot at that moment. There were books coming out. There were a lot of people talking about it. Uh, so it was a good opportunity in theory. So we ended up doing, uh, the, the lead startup came out about that same time. So we ended up uh, following the, pro the, the, the process. We were calling people. We were doing a lot of uh, landing page. We were validating a bunch of stuff. Just trying to do the techniques that were in the book. And we were impressed. It, was a, it seemed like it was going somewhere. But then we worked out. We ended up validating, invalidating six different products in a year and decided to call it quit. So it's a frustrating process at the same time. But there's a lot of things that we learned that were missing as far as the process. And that's the reason why I wrote this book. Uh, so I spent a year and a half researching uh, B2B customer development specifically for B2B, speaking to with a lot of founders from around the world, and putting a system together to do that. So the book is mostly about uh, targeting the largest companies. Uh, so if you're targeting uh, Siemens or Vodafone, trying to get uh, your, your products in place. It's about building products that businesses want. And that's actually written in the book. So. One of the things that B2B founders really struggle with is uh, how do you find your first idea? So where, where do you figure out where to start? What are you going to build? And uh, so there's many ways to do that. A lot of companies just are just going to go and uh, they're going to have, uh, they're going to do compl complex uh, market assessment or you're just going to take ideas from one market to the other. Or some of them look for the uh, eureka moment where they have the glorious idea that will help them grow their business. But what if you don't have to do that? I don't know if you're familiar with the Inc. 500. Yeah. So my question to you is, where did the majority of the founders in the Inc. 500 find their business ideas? In the garage? No, <laughs> it's not even close. <laughs> in a sense, yes, but uh, no. A little bit, yes. Hurricane Closer. Yeah, I'll as well, but not quite yet. Yes, yes. So 50%, according to study by, by um, uh, uh, I don't remember the guy's name, 50% uh, uh, of the, the people that uh, in the Inc. 500 uh, found their ideas while they were working on projects in their own business. So that's 50%. That's uh, quite, quite a lot, actually. Uh, so although my experience has been in trying to get uh, to target businesses from the outside in, I'm actually pretty proud of my animation. Uh, <laughs> I'd like to talk today about the opportunity that you have when you're actually working in a business. So there is uh, a lot of stuff that you can do when you actually have a job, a full-time job in a corporation. So there's nine different benefits that, uh, that came out of it. There are nine different opportunities uh, that you have when you're working for a large corporation. 
first and foremost is easy access to customers. So everybody in the comp comp company can be customers. Uh, so you're able to uh, dig without looking for like an outsider. So you can actually find out a lot of different things without looking like me when I'm trying to target a business uh, from the outside. It's easy to have access to these people, so that's a great way to actually uh, re reduce the friction when you start out. Uh, you know the initiatives and the business priorities. So when you know where the business spends money, you know the business priorities. Uh, it tends to be related, otherwise the business will not be doing very good. Uh, so you're able to find out what the budgets are, what people, what they're investing in. And if you don't, you can ask. Uh, you can find the problem owner. In B2B, complex B2B, you're always selling to a group of people, uh, the buying group or the jury, depending on how they call it, what they call it. Uh, you can figure out what the roles of people are when you're, you're, you're selling. So you're selling to the CFO, you're selling to the director of IT, and you're selling to the end users of the product. So that's one way to figure out who's are going to be involved in your sales. And you can figure out how much money they can spend without having to ask their manager. So they're buying a Tory at the same time which is kind of critical when you're selling something too expensive to someone too low in the organization. Uh, you get credibility and expertise because you're in the industry. So there's ways for you to leverage that. You can talk to other people. Uh, just because you work for Vodafone, if you speak to other people that are in competitors, they're going to be able to speak to you because they want to get the insights and intelligence. Uh, so it's a bit of an unfair advantage that you can leverage. If not, you can fake it. <laughs> Uh, you can run return on investment calculations, so you can figure out how much time the company is wasting, uh, how much money is being wasted as well, what opportunities are being lost. So you can do that while people think you're just working. You can just figure out uh, what's really happening. And that's actually pretty hard to do when you're from the outside because you need to convince people to actually get you those data, which you need to convert, and you can actually standardize and bring that back to businesses. So it's a long cycle. Uh, you can figure out why the company buys certain technology and why they, there, there's other technology that they're not buying. So what, what are the problems, what are the risks that you perceive in technology? And one of the things you want to you fight is the uh, status quo coefficient. So there's, a, there's rules that uh, make it that you need to be able to uh, overcome, uh, beat basically the, the status quo. So there's ways to do that, and it basically by understanding the risk and having a big picture of what the, the issues are, you can just bypass that a little faster. You can build a relevant uh, professional network on business hours. <laughs> uh, you can pivot on the cheap, so you're just at the idea level, and you can explore different things and, until you feel comfortable enough to, uh, to get out of the business. Initially, as, as well, it doesn't take that much time because you can't really spend all your time uh, doing customer development because you're dependent on other people being busy. Uh, so basically, that's one thing you can do on the side while not uh, burning too much cash. And if you play your cards right, you can uh, turbocharge your, your, your process by starting with one customer, which is a lot of startups' uh, problem, and it takes a long time to get their first customer. So these are some of the benefits that you get out of this, but uh, it's actually something that's, that's done uh, very often. We saw the different 50% uh, different, uh, of companies doing it. Uh, a few examples that are uh, in the book. Uh, Martin Ouellette is the, the founder of a company called Talio. I don't know if they were very popular. They, they were pretty big in Europe. Uh, but in North America, basically all of the uh, resumes are sent to, uh, to Talio. So basically, he was working for a company called Exfo. And they, they, they're a telecommunications company. He was, uh, it was in the 90s, so basically he was putting ads in the newspaper, receiving CVs, would go back home, look at them, and, and filter out the crap, and just call back people. And it would be a really time-consuming process that was added on top of his work. So he figured out that that was probably not a good way to do it. Uh, so initial validation came with, uh, with the HR department in his company. And turned to Talio, which turned into... $1.9 billion in 2011. So it can be a, a pretty good uh, success. Uh, I don't know, you might know Dharmesh Shah. He's the founder of Upspot. He did the on, on Startup blog as well. Uh, so his first company before Upspot was actually uh, when he was working for SunGuard. So he had a project in the company and turned that into a business, which in a, in a, uh, 
ultimately the, the business uh, SunGuard was selling the, the technology. So they did all this, the, the selling, they did all the uh, distribution. And when it became a $15 million uh, a year revenue, they actually bought the company. So basically, he just kept going, and he, he was able to uh, build a business that he wanted to buy. Another case as well. Uh, so Mario Bouchard is, uh, he was one of the three people in Canada who had certain expertise. Uh, so he was doing in-building in wireless systems, so basically the optimization of the system for wireless and buildings like the, this one. And when he started the business, it took four months, and they were profitable because he had that expertise that no one else had. And it became a company that I think they're right now they're selling it. It's one of the uh, profit uh, 100 uh, in Canada. So it's probably not that easy. Like there's obviously challenges when you're doing things like that. First stuff is uh, is it a market of one? Like is is it are there other businesses that will be interested in what you're building? So you're only seeing one uh, one slice of the market. So. One company can be an outlier, so it can be a company that uh, has weird processes or weird things that they're doing that doesn't lead to an actual business that's uh, scalable. And doesn't mean that they're going to be buying, so it might be someone's pet problem. Like you might be speaking with someone who's just playing around and telling you how exciting that would be if you were to build something. Uh, there's nothing wrong with consulting, but it's always better to know that you're doing consulting beforehand. So it's one thing, like you need to make sure that it's something that can be standardized and can be uh, scaled. And last but not least is how you will transition from entrepreneur to, uh, to from, from an employee to a an entrepreneur, because there's obvious challenges with that legally. Does that work? Looks like fire. <laughs> All right, so how can you do that? So the first question to ask is whether what you're working on is core to the business. If you're doing something core, even in the enlarged sense, uh, it might be problematic because they might uh, sue you. And if you're doing something that is not core, uh, a lot of times there gonna be, there's going to be the whole uh, build versus buy, and you can actually go in that cycle and try to fall in that. Uh, so last May, we uh, in the startup I'm cur currently helping out, uh, my my CEO had the, was super excited because he got the, uh, an interview with the CTO, potential CTO. So the potential CTO I, I had to build a business. He got it to 75 developers in the team, and it went super well at that point. And since we were looking for for money at that point, I was like, all right, so he'll invest in the business at the same time. That's it's going to be great. And my CEO goes, no, no, he actually needs a paycheck. Okay, so you build a business up to 75 developers and it needs a paycheck, so it didn't work out? It, the, the business collapsed or something like that? No, no, it's still going, it's still working. Okay, so did it get kicked out? No, not really, okay. So it turns out that uh, the company that he built was with a, co a guy he met at the company he was working on before. And they built a business together, it took two years, they had uh, Profits. It was coming in. It was a good business. Was working well. That's where the old the old company took notice, and they decided they were going to sue them. It took seven years from that point, but they actually won, and they were able to get to reclaim the the equity that they had. So basically, game over. Uh, they had nothing in the business, even though nine years in, they had built a business that was uh, growing at at least 75 developers and a big team, a big product, and everything else. So that's one thing to be careful, and that hopefully that's a cautionary tale. So initially, so it's, it's about figuring out what's not working in the business. Um, most of the, the best opportunities come from emerging processes in the business, so things that are changing, things that are not working, where things are broken, uh, how the business is evolving, where the, the future needs. So it's figuring out what the explicit and implicit problems, so the, the explicit problem being the problems that people know they have, and the implicit problems is things you notice that are not working optimally. <laughs> and it's easy to do that because people love to talk about their problems, especially when you're in large business, people are gonna be complaining at the water cooler, oh, this is annoying, I need to do this every day, it takes me six hours. Yeah, so six hours is actually money, so that's, under, that's one way to do it. Uh, network, talk around the problems, get different inputs. You want to make sure that it exists for real, and it's not just one person in a corner 
and a cubicle uh, inventing problems or seeing things that are not there. You want to figure out uh, whether the, it's a painful problem, whether it's, uh, it's tied to budget. Ideally, you want to solve the, the problem of a budget owner, someone who has money. And you want to see that there is potential uh, in the, uh, what you're, you're bringing to, mar to the market. So what's the impact that it's going to have on the, the company? What's the impact it's going to have on the people whose, uh, whose life is impacted by the problem? So there's two different concepts. There's a concept of ROI for the business. But then there's uh, what they call win results. So basically, when you're selling to a team of people, uh, the CFO is not looking for the same result as the uh, user. So the user might want, OK, I want a product that's easy to use, and I want to save the six hours that I waste every day. Good. CFO wants to see uh, impact on the business, that it's going to drive new revenue in, or something else like that. So it's figuring out all these different uh, requirements. Uh, if you're solving something that's real, you're always replacing something. There was a quote about uh, how Excel is actually the biggest competitor for startups, and that's probably partly true, especially if you dig in uh, companies. Uh, there's so many applications that are built in Excel, it's crazy. Like there, There's uh, macros for everything, people that got really creative. And it, it's all actually opportunities because Excel doesn't scale that much, and it's, not, uh, it's usually very custom. So there's things like that that are really interesting. Uh, so sometimes it's Excel spreadsheets, sometimes it's, um, it's legacy system, sometimes it's just manual processes. And if you can't beat the Excel solution, you're not going to succeed. After that, you can understand the market, the uh, watering hole, so where people gather, where they go outside of work uh, to meet up, the influencers, the risk, the buying process, the return on investment, all the different things. It's all things you can explore in the business and figure out uh, without looking like, a, like an outsider. And you're going to create a test plan, somewhere along with the, uh, the, the, the lean startup approach. Uh, you want to figure out that you want to de-risk all your hypotheses that are riskiest. And you want to figure out that there is actually other companies that might buy uh, what, you're, what you're doing. So one company does not make a market. Uh, you need to have other voices and make sure that yeah, there is uh, commonalities in between what you're building. So one company plus one company is a good thing. Uh, you want to watch out along the way of cheerleaders, so people that are just going to tell you, oh, this is great, you keep going, it's good, it's interesting. But interesting gets you in the wall. Like It's going to make you hit a wall at some point. It's terrible. And that's actually one of the big things that I've learned with the previous company, Iravoice. And which is something specific to this uh, you don't want to build. Because in a lot of businesses, actually, you will be stuck. Uh, even what you do on the weekend might be owner owned by the company. So if you have non-competes, there's it's all things you need to figure out. So ideally, you find a way to get out of the business in a way that is, uh, will allow you to build a business afterwards. It can be a bit tricky. It's always better to leave on good terms, because you might be able to convert as real customers. So question for you. So which one makes more sense? Having a job, doing a lot of research, figuring out what you're doing, and then pouring out money. Or doing the research, figuring out what you're doing, and pouring out money before and So you actually have been pouring out money for a little while. No one wants to guess? <laughs> yeah. So basically, like the, the, the startup that I joined in May, I won a company in my book, uh, I recruited me. And basically, the, the part that I've been doing that kind of gets us to where the flag is, uh, it's been roughly four months. Uh, but it's four months without runway, like without money. It's just we were just eating our, 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 uh, our cash, uh, cash bank. So something to consider. I think the, the, uh, one of the most important things is to realize that the shortest path to being a successful entrepreneur is starting with what you currently have. And what do you currently know? And it's something that people tend to, uh, to miss out. Because sometimes you, you might be bored of your company you're in, but you're actually developing expertise. And you have knowledge that, is, uh, that few people have. And that you can actually leverage to start something successful afterwards. As was proven by 50% of the Inc. 500. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions?
questions? <laughs> I'm running around with the microphone. How upfront are you with um, with the companies when you leave them, or how upfront would you suggest someone be if they're leaving a company? Would you say go out and say, "Hey, I've got this cool idea, and I want to leave to do that," or would you advise caution? I would advise to be as as uh, transparent as possible. That's what uh, Dharma Shah did, and I think that's the greatest, the the the, the a best way to avoid being sued in any way. You can have an agreement that this is what you're going to be doing, and you're not going to be stepping their boundaries that they're setting. Questions? More questions? You already left your corporate job? Because <laughs> <laughs> otherwise this was, was very inspiring. So show your hands if possible uh, microphone. No? Okay, so you covered everything. Yeah. <laughs> Any questions about Canada or uh... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, maybe you can give some examples of uh, like Gomez, how he did this, because as far as I, I thought he would start this company, but he probably Which he did, eh? Well, he started with the revenue that were coming in through uh, the deal that he had with the company. So basically, they became the distribution partner. They, they were selling their packaging, actually, what he was building, which was uh, he built a tool to transfer clients from one insurance company to another. And it was not a big, uh, large enough opportunity for the company uh, from, for, for SunGuard. So it's a $5,000 a year, $5, a year uh, opportunity. So it's not very good for a large bank. Um, so basically, he did that. They sold the technology. At some point, they realized that it was a real competitive advantage for them to have it. And that's why they decided to, to, uh, to do that. But there is, a, there is a lot and lot and lot. Like if you speak to, to a bunch of entrepreneurs, you're going to figure out that a lot of people actually got their ideas uh, doing that. It's the same thing for me with my, my first uh, startup. I actually came out of the problems that I had in advertising agencies, doing QA on the sites and 16 different browsers and all these things. So that's things I try to fix. Yeah. Question in the back. The question is that uh, if we are in B2B uh, and I am trying to build a product, do I look for a client first or do I look for some venture investor, venture capitalist or some investor in my company? Uh, both the approaches might have its own uh, benefits and pitfalls, mm -hmm. uh, but which one, uh, which your experience you suggest is a good option? Uh, ideally, if you can avoid looking for money, uh, if you can live with what you have, it's, it's always best because that's a real uh, distraction. Like right now in our business, we have one person doing that full time and it's kind of a pain in the butt having one person less. Uh, so yeah, so there's two things that really matter initially, like before you reach product market fit, if you're doing B2B, so it's uh, one is not running out of money. So making sure that you have your, your base covered. And the other one is finding product market fit. So it's doing doing that. That everything else doesn't really matter initially. Yeah. So uh, the benefit of venture capitalist uh, could be that he can guide the team uh, in yeah. certain other aspects, which is not related to product, but just for the company. Yeah. Uh, but if I just look for the client, I I need somebody who can focus on all the other logistics also. Yeah. Uh, how? How important is this criteria when I'm going to start a new company? You mean how important is it to... Uh... Well, actually, a lot of B2B businesses, successful B2B businesses, were bootstrap. Uh, so that's, that's one way. It's easier to build on revenue than to build on... Uh, I need to build traction, then I need to build engagement, then I need to generate revenue, which is a completely different game. It's more of a, a game of number in, in B2C usually. Uh, so in that sense, um, I think you're better off uh, proving the model a little bit because one of the things if you're doing uh, B2B, they don't, uh, a, a VCs will be more, um, they don't like risk, so they don't always uh, go for B2B, they find less sexy oftentimes. Because uh, one of the things that we learned actually in the last, last year is that uh, one thing that they don't like about B2B if you're doing sales is that you're front, front loading the risk. So basically, I need to invest in sales, so there's money being, being poured out uh, before I get my return, which is not necessarily the case in other types of businesses. But it's, uh, it's a good question. It's, uh, I, I would tend to, to say that uh, you don't necessarily need uh, 
that much initially. You can just, just we do consulting on the side and just figure out at that point. Because at the same time, they're going to be looking for certain metrics that you need to it. And uh, you need to be able to prove those if you want to raise uh, money easily. Okay, any more questions? Yeah, back. So, to be honest, this is actually the biggest inspiration I've ever had to get a corporate job. Okay. <laughs> but, so, if I were to go and get a corporate job, did you notice any trends in the companies which were churning out these 500 inks, um, 50%? Yeah. Was there any trend of the kinds of companies that were tending to spin off these, these awesome, successful startups? I didn't actually go through the list of the 500, uh, Inc. 500, uh, but one of the things that comes out is, is really it's, um, uh, and that's, that's one of the things that came out when I was interviewing the guy from uh, the, the team from Forrester. They're saying that the, 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 the biggest opportunity is really when there's emerging processes, so when there's things that are shifting in the, the business. Because that's things that businesses don't um, have a solid grasp on the, it as a problem. So you didn't see any trends like I don't know tech companies versus I don't know maybe procurement companies. Uh, no, but uh, personally, I think it's there's a lot of really interesting opportunities that are in, in domains that people don't think of. Uh, earlier today, we were talking about uh, uh, karate. Like there's a guy that builds software for karate at uh, schools, but that's. That's one thing, but if you're looking at like B2B, like uh, there's a company in Montreal super successful doing mine uh, software for mines uh, to manage mines. But it's it's these industries that are more traditional that have um, that have uh, opportunities that are underserved because startups don't really think about mines unless you have experience in mines in some way. But it's all of these that are especially mines and uh, uh, oil or all these things. It's super. Uh, there's a lot of money as well, so that's really interesting to be able to do stuff there. But there is none that really emerge and that comes to mind for uh, uh, patterns. Okay, I have another question if I may. So I talked to a lot of startups who say, yeah, we do B2B, and it will be great and everything, so much money. But actually, one of the problems is if you want to approach those, the sales cycle are endless, basically. Yeah. So for example, if you say, yeah, let's go after Mercedes. Yeah. You know, where's the phone number? Yeah. So what would you tell those people? Yeah. What to expect them if you want to really sell to the big corp yeah. from the outside? Yeah. Uh, so it's about figuring out who has the biggest pain and who will see the biggest gain. And that can be a bit tricky. That's kind of what we did for the last, uh, last few months. We, uh, we started with uh, uh, my partner actually had sold in clean tech, um, pharma, uh, aviation, and aerospace. So there's like no relationship between all these, ver these verticals. So you can't really build a market. There's no link between these. Uh, but it was all super long cycles. We're still waiting for CAE to actually implement our software. It's been a year and a half. Um, so that's, that's not the, the greatest way. So we do, what we did, basically, we started from there. We just said, okay, so these are our hypotheses of businesses that, that will be buying faster. And what if we feel the biggest uh, pain, biggest need? So we started with that. We went for, from 52 different verticals to four. Then we started looking at pharma and a couple other like that. We did interviews, we were testing uh, um, basically the pains that they had. So what did the problem match? So did we solve problems that they had? And their expectations of return on investment, uh, and their buy cycle, their sell cycle. So looking at how fast they buy and how, how much of early adopters that they are. Did that for a few months, then we selected one which actually was not exactly what we had initially, went there. And then we did another round of that as well. And now we're targeting IT security specifically because they have, uh, there's a bunch of factors that came out of that. Okay. This sounds very McKinsey way, actually, I would say. So uh, maybe. did you pick up the phone or did you have friends in IT security? Not at all. That's actually the problem. So yeah. Was it all through <laughs> LinkedIn and cold calling? A uh, mix of cold calling, mix of networking, and okay. mix of these things. Ideally, like, what you want to do is you want to find, because a real market will have uh, watering holes, will have places where you can actually meet people. And a fast track is just, okay, there's a conference for IT security. Okay. Let's go there. I can meet 20 people on the same day. Okay. Okay. So, is there one more question here? Hi. Um, I, I've spoken to a few startups now, and I actually volunteered for a startup just to kind of get my mindset in that mode. And I realized that a lot of them don't uh, do any type of marketing. They say, well, my product's great. I don't need marketing. So... I'm a marketer, so I want to hear <laughs> from you what you think about that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think you, 
I agree that you don't need marketing necessarily initially, depending on, like, you need to figure out what the, uh, the, what trigger you're working on a little bit. I don't know if you guys have, have read uh, Lean Analytics. Uh, it's also written by a fellow Montrealer. Okay. Yeah, it's a book, so basically, the, one of the things that he talks about is the one metric that matters, and how that evolves based on the phase you're in. Uh, so initially, right right now, like the, the important thing for us is engagement because that tends to be what breaks or uh, makes companies. Uh, but it might be revenue as well. But once we're just in engagement, it's all within the product. So it doesn't really make sense to do marketing. But once we get into the phase where it's about acquisition, then that becomes super relevant. So the way uh, a lot of businesses that, that I, I know actually do it uh, is basically you want to look at it as a system. I don't know if you're familiar with the, uh, the AARRR Pirates for Metrics from, from uh, Dave McClure. So it's basically the five different boxes that you're going to be dealing with. So there is acquisition, activation, retention, referral, and, and revenue. So in, in B2B, uh, the thing that proves that you have a business is, is revenue. But the thing that will make the business uh, sustainable is engagement. So that's, that's our concern with the business. But you, uh, so depending on the phase you're in, you want to evolve and go through that. Uh, so businesses that I know that work very well, they, they, they went through different phases. So they're just uh, looking at all these hypotheses for all the, this, this process. So along the line, just making sure that, okay, we can get people from uh, this channel, and then we can do this. It becomes a machine in the end, which is, a, I guess, a bit of a soulless way to look at it. But <laughs> that's kind of what investors dig, that you can tell them, like, the, you put $5, you're going to get the eight. Mechanics of the business model, right? Yeah. yeah. So it's a question of time and when to do marketing. That's yeah. Very yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So thanks, Etienne. You will be so yeah. Give him a hand. Okay. okay.